Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your casual criminalist, Simon. What happens on this channel is one of my writers, in this case Chris. He writes me a script, I've never read it, we're going to read it together. This one is all about Henry Lee Lucas, and it's an absolute, it's crazy. It's an absolute cracker, and I have no idea if it's crazy, I have no idea if it's good, I've never read it before. What I'm trying to do here is uh, I'm about to give a plug to something that Chris asked me to give a plug to, and uh, what I'm doing is trying to make you believe that the episode's really good so you won't click off or choose another podcast while I do this plug. You see how it works? It doesn't work because I told you how it works and I've spoiled the illusion. My writer for this episode, Chris Lake, is taking part in the Writer Book in a Day challenge to raise funds for the Kids Cancer Project. And that's a good cause because there's one thing we love. Kids! <laughs> one thing we hate. Cancer! Oh. Oh, okay. Kids with cancer? It's not right. I've got kids. I don't want them to get cancer. Obviously, Simon, why would you even say that? It's kind of f***ed up. The Kids Cancer Project funds research into childhood cancers. They believe no child should have their life cut short by cancer, and their eventual goal is a 100% survival rate. We'll get there eventually. It's going to be awesome. When we finally get rid of cancer, and uh, then we'll just be ravaged by brain diseases when we're old. But then we'll get rid of brain diseases, and then we'll all be living to like 200 or whatever, and there'll be something else that's horrible that we don't even know about yet. Are you high? What? No, I'm not high. Why? You- And then we'll fix that as well because, well look, humans are awesome, medicine's awesome. I'm sorry Chris, let me get back to your points. The challenge involves getting a team together on an agreed day, which happens to be July 24th, to write a kids book, which will go in the Camperdown Children's Hospital Library. Brilliant. Look Chris, this writing's really long. <laughs> It's a really bad thing to say, I'm trying to do Chris a favor, but right at the beginning, Chris, viewer attention is going to be terrible. People hate listening to things about kids with cancer. Three key words, an animal or an object in the theme are sent to the writers. They must all be included in the book. It must be eight to 10,000 words long. Illustrated, this is a book for bigger kids than my kids. The books I read my kid now, they have like, they have like 10 pages, but they're mostly pictures. It's like, I reckon this ad copy here is longer than most of the books that I read my kids. It must be eight to ten kil uh, words long. Illustrate in the books. Illustrate it? In a day? In a single 12-hour session? Good lord. So there's a story about this dude called Colonel Reynolds. Either that or his name is actual Col. But is his name Col Reynolds? Or is he a colonel? That's confusing. <laughs> Let's just call him Colonel because that's awesome. You're an honorary Colonel, Reynolds. He started this movement, this idea, and pretty soon he was doing some... Okay, look, it came from somewhere, but look, it's a good idea, isn't it? It's, you're making a book, you're raising funds for kids with cancer. Brilliant. The writer book in a challenge there's raised over 250,000 pounds, I'm assuming, because Chris is British. There's no uh, symbol here telling me what currency. Chris has done it for a few years. This year, he gets a plug from me. That's Chris Lake. There's a link below. Um, yes, brilliant. Let's crack on. Oh my god, Simon, you made it even longer with all of your asides. <laughs> people complain they're like simon just read the bloody ads what i like to do is try to I, I don't know look it's just my personal preference because i watch a ton of youtube and i listen to a ton of podcasts i hate the adverts where it's like blah 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 it's like yo if you want to advertise that they could just pay someone to like read the, the the copy i like to try and make it at least a little bit interesting because those are the ads that, that ads that i like to to hear simple really isn't it but still complain i don't mind whatever let's crack on oh i changed my microphone stand i know we will get to the episode i promise to god we'll get to the episode this microphone stand changed because people are like simon what are you doing below the table because that desk is shaking something terrible and i'm like well i i i do that thing i can't sit still and i'm like always shaking my leg anyone else do that i know other people do that i have a case of uh, chronic anxiety like, yeah, you'll be sitting down somewhere and I'll be shaking my leg and someone else will be like, you do that as well. I'll be like, yeah, I do that. You do that? And they'll be like, yeah, I do that. It's like, okay, it's a little club. We're in, all right, guys? Like, let me know in the comments below if you do that. We do. So I changed my microphone to a microphone stand that doesn't bounce around. You're welcome. Henry Lee Lucas, the confession killer. We're finally there. Chris, like, wrote it. There's, oh my God, Chris, is there really a pre-intro and an actual intro? We are actually five minutes into the video, Chris. And we haven't even got... We're, Let's go. Oh my god, son. you are the worst content producer ever. No one w How do people even watch you, Simon? It's embarrassing. <laughs> T 
Typically, any writer worth their soul will open a piece with an attention-grabbing intro replete with pathos, compelling story hooks, and the literal use of the rule of threes. What they don't do is burden the audience with... It's embar- I don't know what pathos is. <laughs> I know what the rule of threes is, because I used to do uh, debating and uh, like speech stuff. And... Um, one of the most compelling ways to like make a point is to say it's this and this and that trinity is everywhere it sounds so much better than doing four or doing two always go for three if that's what the rule of threes means in writing that's what it means in debating and speech giving so uh yeah what they don't do is burden the audience with dry discussions of source criticism and historiography because that's the kind of writing done by those posers who spend their days in cafes ostentatiously using laptops the ones who've never been published as they never actually finish anything worth reading or have shown anything to anyone who might conceivably buy it <laughs> chris is throwing that shade but i digress the fact is the case of Henry Lee Lucas makes it unavoidable, as I have to set expectations straight away. Henry Lee Lucas and his erstwhile lover, Otis. I'm sorry, I've got a pronunciation guy. That's not how you say Otis. Otis. Otis? Who pronounces Otis Otis? I suppose it's got a double T, so you'd. Ot Otis. You'd shorten the O, right? After a. Uh, for a preceding letter of a double letter that follows. Otis. All right then. <laughs> Otis Tool have been regarded. I'm definitely going to screw that up. Have been regarded as America's worst serial killers for decades, despite a near total lack of evidence and layer upon layer of contradiction and dispute. Even the pronunciation of Otis's name seems to be disputed. The Appellate Court of Texas, as well as roughly half the documentaries covering him, use the standard pronunciation Otis. Yes. Otis. Oh, whereas everybody else, especially Texans, pronounce it phonetically as dictated by the double T. Big brain or what, whistleboy? I'm quite impressed with myself. So I know it's like basic f English, but I'm dumb. Maybe just and like the double T, the, the shorter letter before the double letter, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> nailed that. Sh Otis himself has confusingly used both. Uh, beyond this, a perfect conjunction of deliberate myth making. Uh, look, I'm just going to call him Otis. Because he uses both. I don't care what you think about in Texas. Most people seem to use Otis. Let's just go for that. And uh, everyone else can just, uh, well, f*** off, really, to be honest. All right, my man! Ah! <laughs> I've made an executive decision. Beyond this, a perfect conjunction of deliberate myth-making, moral panics, the peak of television's cultural ascendancy, and the legendary Texas Rangers made them a national sensation, an integral part of the fabric of America's national memory, as well as the darker side of its identity. This needs to be balanced against the fact that most of their story is utter bullshit, and it's unlikely that we'll ever know exactly what they did and to whom, but hopefully this won't be too much of an issue. To my mind, the perverse obsession with necrophilia, cannibalism, and incest porn to which this story is so often reduced isn't actually the main event. Wow, really? The, <laughs> the necrophilia and cannibalism isn't the main event? I'm just wondering how, or incest, but I'm wondering how we could get worse. What this story's really about is an appalling miscarriage of justice perpetrated by some sections of law enforcement and exposed by the courageous efforts of victims' families, other sections of law enforcement, and the modern era's favorite whipping boy, the mainstream media. Yeah, also, modern era's favorite whipping boy. Because the mainstream media is like, I, and I don't think alternate media, other than, of course, my wonderful channels, but like when you say alt media, alternative media, you think, oh God, <laughs> where are we going? We're going to that Nazi website. Ah, but mainstream media is just a bit that 24 hour news cycle i really think just really and the internet being a part of that 24 hour news cycle really did ruin the news in a lot of ways because it just made everything a story and the the desperation of news outlets to be first and it's better to be to them for views and money it's better to be first and incorrect or like halfway correct and first than it is to be second and right, which is, yeah, I don't know how we fix that, but it's kind of broken. But I've held you 
all up long enough and uh, we'll save my note on sources for when it's more directly relevant and now without further ado here's that narrativized intro i really wanted to put at the top it's the early 1980s bob and joyce lemon are going lemon sorry are going about their business taking care of daily tasks and generally trying to get on with their lives it's an ordinary day marred only by the deep scars of an unresolved tragedy so it's a bit of a surprise when they receive a call from a lubbock detective saying they've caught the man who murdered their daughter deborah Deborah Sue Agnew Williams died age 18 in 1975, roughly eight years earlier. She was a happy, kind young woman who'd been recently married. She'd been Mrs. Williams for about 10 weeks. One day, her husband Doug came home to find his new bride lying in a pool of her own blood on the carpet outside their house, brutally stabbed to death. Uh, this is brutal, but I have to ask, who has carpet outside of their house? That seems like a very weird thing to do. I recently discovered that outside rugs are a thing and uh, i've got a big deck and my wife was like you know what really look good on this i'm a, a rug and i'm like yeah if you want us to go moldy with about a week and she's like no there's things such as outside rugs and i'm like that's pretty great let's get one of those and so we shall fascinating sidebar simon well done years have dragged by with no progress in the case and the whole family suffered hellish uncertainty corrosive suspicion and profound grief for close to a decade suspicion i it's suspicious suspicion is like you know csi it's always the husband and if it's not the husband it's the wife of the husband who killed the husband the other way around you know what i mean when it's the kids it's not the parents <laughs> So when Bob and Joyce heard a man named Henry Lucas had confessed, they experienced a sense of relief that it's rather difficult to imagine, and which Bob, when speaking about it, didn't attempt to describe. Obviously, they headed straight to the station to hear the taped confession of this Henry Lucas character. At this point, their relief, their sense that their ordeal might finally be over, is cruelly snatched away. To quote, it was like a joke. This was Bob Lemon speaking to an ITV documentary team. He knew that it had been, sorry, the quote continues, he knew she had been stabbed, but he got every other thing wrong. Every other thing. Lucas had confessed to breaking into a white house, but Deborah's house was green. He described breaking in through the patio door. That particular door had been walled shut. He claimed to have stabbed her to death in the bedroom, but her body had clearly been found where she had been killed, in the carport. Okay, so you could have carpet in the carport. Oh, I see. I see what happens. Uh, I see what happens. Chris, uh, Chris is also correct. Took carport and turned it into carpet. So my side of outside carpets is totally pointless. Oh, good. They raised their concerns with Texas Ranger Bob Prins, who agreed that Lucas had a lot of murders on him that had given confessions to other crimes which contained details only the killer could have known, and that it wasn't worth sweating a few small details when all could be explained by the sheer number of murders that he'd committed. So basically, Lucas was to be believed because he remembered many details of other killings and also because he couldn't remember the details of Deborah's. Unsatisfied, the Lemons started their own investigation, tracing Henry Lucas's movements, a revolutionary approach known back then as elementary f police work. <laughs> nice, nice, Chris, I like that. They eventually tracked down Henry's half-sister in Maryland, who said she'd kick Lucas out of her home for molesting her grandchildren. She confirmed, regretfully according to the report, that Henry was living with her in Maryland, more than 1,600 miles away from Lubbock at the time of the murder. She'd be like, yeah, yeah, look, I know he's a piece of s***, and I hate to do this, but he was f***ing here. He was here molesting my children. It's, yeah, I know, I know. But that's where we are, officer. The Lemons went back to Ranger Prince, and they were told that they could either leave the station of their own volition or by force. Holy s***, guys. I don't know if Prince ever read anything by Franz Kafka, but it could have been lifted straight out of the pages of the trial. I remember my first ever lesson uh, in a constitutional law class. The professor was like, just go read the trial, and that will give you a really good like feeling for constitutional law. And I went home, and I read the trial, and constitutional law became by far my favorite subject. If I, if I ever, I, I used to think at some point I'd like, I'd love to go back to university and like continue my education, like further education into something like yeah, get a, you know a bigger degree. And I always thought constitutional law would be it. It's so interesting. I, I, I'm not gonna go on. It's just an interesting subject. 
Deborah's younger sister is still investigating the murder to this day, but as the years go by, it's becoming more likely that the real murderer might never be found, in large part due to the Rangers having closed the case on the strength of an inconsistent confession made by a compulsive liar. It's it's crazy that the police are okay with just believing this, because, like, people confess to crimes they don't do all of the time, because apparently that's a... I didn't know that was really a thing. I mean, I did, you know, you're, you're familiar with it, but quite apparently how often it happens is why. I have a confession to make. Kafka was right. And I was like, okay. And I mean, not just like forced confessions, but people just being like when police get too heavy with the interrogation. But like actual people being like, nah, I killed all those people. Is that but you didn't though, did you? Nah, I didn't. I just I just said I did. <laughs> What are you up to? If you can't get famous, get infamous. This wasn't an isolated incident. Hundreds of cases across 27 states would end up being closed or seriously derailed over a period of years as star suspect Henry Lee Lucas and his sidekick Otis. Chris has included a pronunciation guide for me again. Otis. Let Chris. You're not going to include that pronunciation guide all the way through. And I'm definitely going to screw it up. So let's just relax. Otis Tool eagerly confessed to 600 killings, oh my good lord, triggering one of the most spectacular miscarriages of justice in America's modern history. So this f***ing guy and his partner are just rolling around confessing to crimes to get police to close cases, so actual murderers are still on the loose. What the f*** are you up to? And how have I never heard of this? The Other Hundred On the 11th of July, 1983, police in Stoneburg, Texas, arrested a penniless drifter named Henry Lee Lucas in connection with the disappearance of two women, 82-year-old Kate Rich and 15-year-old Frida Becky Powell. Becky's like in, you know, quotations here, so like Frida Becky Powell, you know, like her nickname's Becky. How do you get Becky from Frida? <laughs> they lack the evidence to hold him. It'd be like, yeah, my name's Simon, you can just call me Bob. <laughs> okay. They lack the evidence to hold on to him. But were able to keep him in custody for a weapons charge. Lucas was a convicted felon, having served 10 years for killing his own mother, and was barred from owning firearms. Lucas, then 46 years old, had been living with Kate Rich and Becky, the 15 year old, was known to be his common law wife. The sheriffs thought they could sweat Henry Lee pretty easily. He was a nobody with a hick accent and low intelligence, just a dirty, shabby, one eyed bum, and they figured it was unlikely that he was going to go into trouble them with petty stuff like due process or habeas corpus <laughs> i'm really tempted to make just jokes here but it doesn't do it do it do it like about this guy and him being a bit dim but i'm not going to because we have a classier show than that <laughs> We don't. Oh, we don't really know what happened next. According to the sheriff's department, Lucas was held in custody for four to five days. He requested an interview to clear things up. According to Lucas himself, he was beaten, stripped, and deprived of sleep, coffee, and cigarettes for five days before he begged to confess in exchange for some smokes. I feel like the deprivation of sleep is a lot more serious than not giving someone coffee or cigarettes. It's like, mate, you're in prison. There's no coffee. You basically get water and gruel. And cigarettes? Are you smoking crack? You can't even- you def- you shouldn't be, and there's no cigarettes. Whatever actually happens, we know that after five days of confinement, Lucas told one of his jailers that he'd, quote, done some bad things. He asked for pen and paper to write a letter to Sheriff Conway. This led to an interview where Lucas waived his rights to an attorney before confessing to killing both women. He was able to corroborate this by telling police exactly where to find their belongings and remains, as well as describing the murders to a level of detail which simultaneously chimed with evidence already found and added clarity to the police picture of the case. Lucas told the cops that he'd stabbed Kate Rich to death before having sex with her body. <laughs> Necrophilia, my dude, come on. Um, then stuffing it into a pipe. It's a f***ing massive pipe. He claims to have come back later and burnt it in a wood stove behind the cabin that he was staying in at the time. He also described how he'd murdered Becky. She'd wanted to return to Florida, where Lucas had lived for a time, but Lucas liked Texas. He said the argument got heated and he hit her, unaware she was holding a knife at the time, a remarkably similar story to the one he had told about killing his own mother, for which he'd already served ten years. He went on to recount having sex with the corpse before carefully dismembering the body and scattering it around as well as her belongings. He also returns later to bury the body parts in shallow pits. It's weird. It's just weird. Like how that sounds like a big hassle. What are you doing?
Lucas was able to direct police to the remains of both Becky Powell and Kate Richards, as well as to their possessions, and he went on to describe another 77 murders spread across the United States. Of these, several murders that he had claimed had committed in Maryland were handed over to police state troopers who investigated them thoroughly and found no evidence that they'd actually been committed. Oh, that's just making shit up. At his July the 21st arraignment, Lucas admitted to the murders of Rich and Powell and then mumbled, oh, what are we going to do about the other hundred women I killed? There was a moment of stunned silence before the court confirmed that he was in fact confessing to another 100 murders. This was a public arraignment in a courtroom full of reporters who wasted no time spreading the story far and wide, and thus was born the legend of Henry Lee Lucas, America's most prolific serial killer. I guess that's like, it's like, yeah, well, I've already been sentenced to death or to life in prison. May as well just go after some notoriety, get my name in the press, f with them a little bit. Because, I mean, you're in prison for the rest of your life anyway. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I murdered 100 people. No, you didn't. <laughs> Stop lying. Bigger than Elvis. When Henry Lee first put his hand up for so many murders, Sheriff Jim Botwell, at the time a legendary lawman and former Texas Ranger, decided to call in his old unit. The Texas Rangers, one of the USA's oldest and most famous police forces, started when Texas was first wrested away from Mexico in the early 19th century. They were initially a citizen militia charged with securing the frontier against Native American and Mexican raids. During this amazing, these guys survived to the present day. Do other states have rangers? I was Black Power Ranger. Like, would you have, like, California Rangers? <laughs> Like, why can't I think of a good US state? I'm trying to think of something more like like Delaware Rangers, like a small state that does nothing. No offense, people from Delaware. I don't know anything. Delaware's just a small island, right? Rhode Island! Is that a state? Rhode Island Rangers? Hawaii Rangers? These aren't things, are they? Probably not. But I feel like everything else, you know, you've got the, the states have like similar systems, right? You know, you got like NYPD, LAPD, LVPD. KGB? CPD? I don't know. <laughs> During the US Civil War, they were absorbed into the Confederate Army under the famous Colonel Terry, and then, after Texas was readmitted to the Union, went back to being frontier guards and peace officers. By 1901, the frontier had basically disappeared, and the Frontier Battalion, as they were known at the time, was dissolved, and the new laws turned the Rangers into exclusively peace officers. Throughout the years of World War I, Prohibition, the Mexican Revolution, and the oil boom, the Rangers shrunk drastically, outpaced by the pressures of the modern world. They had a renaissance in 1935 when the Texas Department of Public Safety was created. This department absorbed the remaining Rangers, boosted their numbers and powers, and for the first time put them to work exclusively as a statewide police force. As we can see from the storied history, the Rangers are part of the story of America, of the Old West, and especially of Texas, and also they somehow survive. Isn't Chuck Norris? I wasn't he in that TV show? Someone, Texas Ranger. A friend of mine loves this show. And I'm like, dude, this show's from like back in the day. And you're exact, he's like two weeks older than me. And I'm like, how have you seen this? You're not even, you're, he's Spanish. And he's like, Texas Ranger. I'm like, okay, dude. <laughs> Never seen it, never will. And their unusual, often ambiguous status and their frontier militia origins have deeply marked their culture and the way they operate to this day. In short, the Texas Rangers were a legendary police force collaborating with a legendary lawman. And nobody had any doubts that putting together a task force out of these materials would quickly crack open the case of what Henry Lee Lucas and Otis too had been getting up to all of these years. About a week after the hundred more incident, Henry asked if he might be allowed to send a letter to Otis Toole to see if he'd be okay with him confessing to a bunch of murders they'd committed together. Otis agrees. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, Otis, no more. Wait, what was the name Otis agree? What was uh, the other guy's name? Henry, yeah, Otis, sorry, Otis. Yeah, Otis will just be like, yeah. Yeah, sounds good, Henry. No worries. I mean, I'm not worried about that. We killed hundreds of people. It was going to catch up to us at some point, whether you confess to it or not. Don't worry about Henry. <laughs> what are you doing, Otis? Friends forever. Best friends forever. And he had a telephone conversation with Rangers and other law enforcement listening in, supervising the call. According to one of the Rangers' presents, they milked this call for all it was worth. They discussed their past crimes and vied with each other in trying to appear more badass. It was clear there was some unresolved tension between the two, with Otis saying, Remember when I drank the blood to see what a man tasted like? 
up, dude. And then joshing Henry for shying away from eating the flesh of one of their victims when he'd cooked it up with barbecue sauce. Henry shot right back, saying he'd only refused because he didn't like the taste of barbecue sauce and going on to boast how many women he'd raped. Oh my god, this is... As if they didn't do this stuff, so what the f***? After this phone call, Otis Tool began talking as well, backing up statements made by Henry, confessing independently to murders and soaking up his share of prison privileges and media attention. Most notably, Otis confessed to the murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh. He said he'd grabbed Adam from a Sears car park, raped him for several hours over a couple of sessions, and then when Adam began demanding he be taken home, he decapitated him with a machete. He claims to have driven around with the severed head in the back seat for weeks, having forgotten about it. When he found it, he tossed it into a canal. Adam's head was found in a canal, and his father that John Walsh still firmly believes Otis Tour committed the murder. What's notable about this is that Mr. Walsh's grief and trauma gave him a sense of mission, which led him to create the hit television show America's Most Wanted. No way! He created that show, a TV sensation which aided in the capture of over 1,500 criminals, which we've talked about before, and it's amazing. It's not possible to say whether Otis Tool killed young Adam or not. The case was understandably a high-profile one and had been open for some time before Otis confessed. And it's clear to me, from watching hours of his interviews, that very little reliance can be placed on almost anything Otis says, not least because he's contradicted nearly everything he's ever said, sometimes in the course of a single sentence. Otis was initially reluctant to discuss his crimes, but once news reached him that Henry was taking officers on guided tours of crime scenes, he began to loosen up and eventually copped to 109 murders. Did they kill anybody? They, I feel like they they must have killed someone and then they're just like amping it up. And But then to know the details and stuff about their head in the canal, but this can often just be looked up because it's not secret. It's either been covered by the press or maybe it's public record, stuff like that. I mean, I know police do keep some stuff secret, so you could, you know, they can be like, and uh, what did you leave on the body? And the killer won't know. And then they'll be, well, we know you didn't. The person who's confessing won't know. And it's like, well, we know you're not the actual person. Well, let's see where this goes. It all started quite humbly with the task force led by Sheriff Botwell and Texas Ranger Robert Prins coordinating a phone-in center. They'd call officers from jurisdictions where Henry Lee claim I just realized I went to a school with a dude called Henry Lee. Did he touch you? What? Not Henry Lee Lucas, just Henry Lee. <laughs> I haven't thought about this dude in like 20 something years. That's so weird. It's like, oh, Weird. Okay. Uh, he claimed to have killed somebody and facilitated interviews with investigators from those areas. As I said earlier, some of these claims were investigated properly and immediately dismissed. The murders of Kate Rich and Frida Becky Powell were a lock, no matter what later commentators might say. Lucas knew the times, places, dates, and dump sites. He had their possessions, and those he'd dumped, he was able to help the police recover. It was only much later, when the House of Cards was falling and Lucas was making his dim-witted bid to avoid a death penalty bounce, that he and his defense lawyers cast doubt on these convictions. In the trawl was also a woman called, at the time, Orange Socks, after the only article of clothing she was wearing when her body was found. She's since been identified as Deborah Jackson, and there's now some doubt as to whether Lucas actually committed this murder, despite it being the one for which he was sentenced to death. In the meantime, Lucas was confessing to more and more murders. It wasn't long before Henry Lee Lucas was famous. He was shown on nightly news bulletins and routinely described as America's worst serial killer. The number of killings credited to him in the media went from 100 to 300 to 600 in a quick time, and before long, people were bandying around numbers in the neighborhood of a thousand. Henry Lucas had reached superstar status, with local and national news outlets requesting recordings of his interviews, or to be present at some, and bathing Sheriff Botwell and Ranger Prince in the warm glow of celebrity. As Henry said in one of his many taped interviews, I was bigger than Elvis. Yeah, but dude, infamy's not the same. It's just not. Very soon, hundreds of officers were coming to meet with Henry, with the task force acting as his body men and chauffeurs and controlling access to their star suspect. Wow, when you like attention so much that you're willing to confess to, like, hundreds of murders, you're some, that's, that's some level of narcissism right there, my dude. Jesus. I hate him. There's quite a bit of famous footage showing the rangers sitting around with Henry, laughing, joking. In one of the infamous videos, the rangers are sitting around at a table with their prisoner, who's uncuffed, joking that they must have lost the handcuffs and guffawing about it, just all good old boys together doing the Lord's work. That is not appropriate, my guys. <laughs> 
Like, how do you think that's going to look? <laughs> Reporters noted that Henry was free to wander around the prison and police stations, often letting himself through electronically locked doors by punching in the key codes that had obviously been given by the rangers. When they went out to crime scenes, they'd invariably stop at fast food restaurants on the way out and the way back. Henry had a particular fondness for strawberry milkshakes, and they'd buy burgers and steak dinners for their prisoner. Henry lapped this up. He had been born in a four-room shack in Virginia and spent most of his childhood sleeping in a chicken coop. Really? <laughs> Why? Uh, and had never been so well off in his life. He'd proudly show journalists and visiting police officers the stacks of cartons of cigarettes, and he'd boast that he'd never eaten so many hot meals in his entire life as he did in one week under the care of the task force. He also said that he had more spending money than he'd ever had before, and described Sheriff Botwell as being like a father to me and range of princes like my brother on one okay oh my god guys how do you think this is i was just reading the news <laughs> and this will be like six months out of date but it was like this is a story in the news and it's like prince charles it seems he took a bag of money from like some saudi prince or like some like some sheik or whatever some dude he's like you know and he just accepts like a giant bag with like a million pounds in it and Charles, oh yes, well it was all above board. We looked into the, you know, everything was sorted out here and it went to my charities. And it's like, Prince Charles, that may be the case. But when you're getting a giant bag of money from a Saudi prince and you're just taking it and you're like, well, I'm going to do all my good due diligence on all of this. You still have to think about how it's going to look, mate. You're the future f***ing king. You shouldn't be just accepting giant bags of money, especially when people are like, well, just the cash for honors thing. Did you did you take some money to give someone like a little bit of a leg up or a citizenship or something? Which I mean, it's not a good look for you, is it, Charles? This isn't a good look for these rangers. What I'm trying to say is you have to think about perception. And this is not a good perception. On one occasion, Henry copped to the murder of a police officer whose death had been ruled a suicide. The result was that the widow was granted a life insurance claim, which otherwise would have been denied. The rangers celebrated this by booking out a restaurant and allegedly spent $3,000 on booze and hookers, apparently with their prisoner in attendance. This is f***ed up. It's worth pointing out here that as bad as all this looks, it's not entirely without justification. There's quite a lot to be said for keeping an informant sweet, and establishing rapport with them is the gold standard of interrogation techniques. It's not all that incredible that Henry would have these feelings towards his captors, especially if they were skilled interrogators. And it's not that unusual for the officers, after an extended period of time, to start becoming genuinely friendly with an interrogation suspect, especially one so cheerfully cooperative and easy to please as Henry. I was reading a fascinating article on Quora the other day about Saddam Hussein's executioners and they were like holding him in prison uh, in prison like these American soldiers or whatever and they became friends with him they were there for months just hanging out with him and obviously he's like the leader of a country and he's a bad dude he's a really bad dude but he has he must have had some charisma to be in the position he's in and uh, yeah when they died they were like it was quite sad he didn't really want to kill him and I'm like, that is, that's some heavy, it's like reverse Stockholm syndrome or something. Anyway, the way Henry told it is he and Otis would go on long road trips looking for people or places to rob. On the way, they'd pick up hitchhikers, women for Lucas and men for Tool. Lucas said he preferred to kill his women quickly as he preferred sex with dead bodies. Oof, dude. Quote, a live woman ain't nothing to me. I mean, this guy was a real jerk. If you don't, don't, why would you let those words come out of your mouth? That's, that's up. Lucas said this on one of the many occasions he explained his preference for necrophilia. Thanks for the clarification, Chris. <laughs> we knew. According to them, they would usually rape their victims before killing them either by strangulation, stabbing, battery, or gunshot. They would then have sex with the corpses before mutilating them and disposing of the bodies. And when they were forced to move out of Otis's mother's house, where they shared a room, they took Otis's nephew and niece, Frank and Frida, with them and continued to commit sex crimes and murders in front of the children. Because, I mean, yeah, it's like necrophilia, murder, mutilating bodies. How can we make this worse? Let's do it in front of children. Great idea, Otis. Brilliant. We've made it worse. Sometimes they would commit robberies, either burglaries or armed robberies, killing their victims to eliminate witnesses. Henry said that when he discovered Otis also had a proclivity for killing, he coached him in how to vary his M.O. To quote, he was killing people in the same way, with the same weapon every time, said Henry, going on to explain that it taught Otis to mix it up, 
to prevent police in different states from connecting the offenses to each other, incorrectly assuming that local and state law enforcement were well coordinated across jurisdictions. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, unfortunately, no. Interestingly, Otis mentions this little bit of tradecraft as his own idea, lecturing journalists and police interrogators as he's delivering a Murder 101 course. No, mate. People that it's like blindingly obvious. Whoever had the idea originally, this in the eyes of the police explains the widely different modes of killing across the hundreds of victims, which in any other circumstances would strongly suggest they've been killed by entirely different people. Why am I getting the feeling that they were killed, actually killed by entirely different people? Seems uh seems quite likely, doesn't it? Anyway, at some point during their years-long spree, they were recruited by a satanic cult. Oh, weirdly, the episode I recorded this before this was also about a satanic cult. There you go. We're all about those satanic cults. Probably clickworthy and definitely a great way to get my advertising on YouTube removed. Sad times. Fortunately, we have the podcast advertising, which uh, definitely helps. The cult wanted a podcast ever like they don't care they'll be like what's this about uh necrophiliacs mutilating bodies in front of children we'll sp sure sure yeah no worries we'll sponsor that <laughs> <laughs> oh podcasts love it the cult wanted to use them as hitmen and gave them several months of training in order to become in henry's words killing machines for satan sometimes they'd be tasked with finding children to be sacrificed in rituals or instructed to rape and kill people in order to spread evil in the world other times they'd be sent to eliminate threats to the cult or people whom the cult deemed too godly or too prone to spread the good in the world these jobs were apparently well paid with some killings netting up to ten thousand dollars where are they getting the money from where's this demon cut this is such bullshit. This apparently came to an end when Becky, Frieda, and Henry fell in love and ran away together, abandoning Uncle Otis. When asked about Henry during one interview, Otis replied, Henry was a person I used to love, but that love turned to hate. If I saw him now, I'd like to shove a baseball bat right in his mouth, right in there, and then I'd shove it in so deep it would come out his ass, sticking right out of his ass. Then I'd put him in a barbecue pit, and there'd be people all around, all the cops and the guards, and they'd love some barbecue, and then I'd tell them, you just ate a human body. That's what I'd like to do. Oh my god. You f***ing psycho. <laughs> he can, he's just making it up there, couldn't he be? Because that's what he's up to. So it seems he was a bit annoyed about Henry running off with his niece. <laughs> you could say that. You could say a bit annoyed. You could. Or you could say he's really angry. The Henry Lee Lucas Task Force, the one Botwell and Prince had set up, became an industrial-scale clearinghouse. One thing that gets lost in this case is the fact that there was, in fact, a suspected serial murder operating around Lubbock and McLennan counties at the time, and Sheriffs Botwell and Conway were under significant pressure to get some results in the investigation. Well, when a guy just confesses, you're like, yeah, 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 no, I mean, you don't know any details of the crime, but oh my god, can we shut this down and get the reporters to f*** off? I mean, I get why they do it, but we've got to sort out that, because that's not, that's not good, guys. So, when Kate Rich and Frieda Becky Powell disappeared with a clear suspect who'd been convicted for the murder of his own mother, no less, it's likely that they genuinely thought they had their man. It's even possible that Henry Lucas was their killer, or at least was responsible for some of the murders. So, the initial steps taken, calling in the state authorities in the form of the Texas Rangers, setting up a task force, and questioning their prisoner about other murders in the area, all of this was not only reasonable, it was good police work, especially in light of the fact that Henry's first confession, the hundred more thing was unsolicited. Where most people start to find fault is in the way the Rangers allowed the Henry Lucas confession to balloon unchecked and the lack of police work done by the sheriffs and the Rangers as the investigation wore on. In fact, investigation is far too flattering a moniker for what actually followed. First of all, there was the nature of the suspect. Cops are exposed to quite a few false confessions, especially those with experience of high-profile cases. I know Simon's pretty gobsmacked by the whole concept. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I expressed my surprise at this in previous episodes, and I expressed my surprise again today, because it's f***ing surprising! <laughs> but to be fair, so are most people. Yes! There's a whole branch of criminal psychology which deals exclusively with the phenomena of false confessions, and... Even they sometimes struggle to explain why it happens. But what they have done extremely well, though, is develop a typology for a typical confessing Sam. It's broad, as there are many different kinds, but Henry Lucas fits 
perfectly. His pathetic eagerness to please, his parasocial bonding with his captors, the way he'd give wild guesses until he hit on the right details, and his increasingly implausible explanations for why he didn't know them. All this and more should have rung alarm bells for the members of the task force and the horde of out-of-state cops and investigators who descended on him. And to be fair, it did for some. Notably, a couple of rangers on the task force did have doubts, but they were quickly bullied into silence or moved to other duties, and the Henry Lee Lucas carnival of death just kept rolling on. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, isn't it? <laughs> just... This is like, I mean, I was gobsmacked to false confessions before, and today it's like, oh my god, this is, they go deep. Things fall apart. By 1985, the Henry Lee Lucas show was at its height, with multiple documentaries, news features, articles, and interviews keeping the public's interest in these phenomenal killers alive. This is exactly what they want. There's a thing called herostratic fame, which is fame for doing something bad, like super infamy. And it comes after, I made a video all about this. There was a guy called Hero, <laughs> Herostratus, that was his name. And uh, he burned down this giant temple. There was this amazing temple in ancient Greece or some shit like that. And it was beautiful and it was made of wood. And he just went in there and he set that bitch on fire and it burned down and they executed him. And then they uh, they memento mori him, which is where they remove him from the history books. But it obviously didn't work. And it didn't work to the extent. And this guy, when asked why he did it, he was like, I just want to be remembered. <laughs> and he is, because we're here we are talking about him like hundreds of years, thousands of years later. Herostratus. What a dickhead. Burned down this beautiful temple. It was fortunate, or unfortunate, that Henry's confessions coincided with the beginning of the satanic ritual abuse panics of the 1980s, started by Lawrence Pazder and his wife and patient Michelle Smith, who published a book of supposedly recovered memories of SRA, that's uh, satanic ritual abuse, that she'd suffered as a child. It hardly needs pointing out that recovered memory therapy is garbage and caused untold harm and suffering in the years before it was finally discredited. Yep, yeah, made a video about that as well. The satanic panic is at absolutely nuts it's like the number of people were accused of what did you do uh i uh, abused and mutilated children and or like that's what people were accused of and it's like that people were like oh my god all of this has come out there have been multiple accounts it's a whole thing and it turns out it's just bullshit which is just <laughs> Though in fairness, it did cause some increases in child protection funding. Anyway, the idea of kidnapping, raping, torturing, and eating the innocent was very front of mind for the American public at the time, so the existence of an apparently concrete example of this phenomenon was of great interest to them, and perhaps not as unbelievable as it might have been without the SRA panics. On top of this, the malefactor was being brought to justice by the legendary Texas Rangers, a fantastic outcome, and a feel-good story in a way, despite all the spine-tinglingly grisly details. Yeah, I'm like, this doesn't feel like a good outcome. People were murdered and eaten, and they were necrophiled, if that's even a word. I don't want to repeat what happened, so I'm just going to use the word they were necrophiled rather than they dead people. describing the events again, even though they probably didn't happen, which is nice to imagine, even though stuff like that does happen all the time. I mean, not all the time, but like regularly enough, which is not nice to imagine. What the f humans? The problem was that intelligent, experienced people were starting to have serious doubts about the case being built against Henry and Otis. I mentioned before that their frontier militia roots were formative to their whole approach to policing, and it's worth adding here that it's also contributed to an existential crisis that they've been going through, and which arguably started with the Henry Lucas case. The Rangers are a proud and highly traditional force who've shown a dogged resistance to any effort to modernize their methods. There were mass regulations when the first female Rangers were sworn in with some old rangers citing doubts as to whether women could hack the frontier outdoor lifestyle associated with being a ranger. This is like one of those things that it's like, yeah, all those guys resigned and no one gives a sh**. It's like, well, okay, good, because the force is changing and to replace them will bring in some more women because it's 2022. Welcome to the future. And now you may leave. <laughs> it's like, what? And if they can't hack it, then they won't be able to continue. But just because they're women doesn't mean they shouldn't get a shot. It's like, um, it's like Prime Ministers of the United Kingdom. We tried it with Margaret Thatcher, and that went, you know, not very well. People don't like her. And they tried it with Theresa May, and now it's like, well, obviously women can't be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It's just not going to work. This is a joke, just to be absolutely clear. It's a joke. 
And they were both also like, I don't know. <laughs> Mar- I got, I've got opinions of Margaret Thatcher that are not very popular <laughs> with people. Like, I don't, I'm not even going to say. Like, it feels like the, <laughs> this is old British politics that no one cares about. Let's just move on. But Theresa May. Bit of a disaster, wasn't it, Theresa? <laughs> this, despite the fact that even back then investigators were about as likely to be playing harmonica around a campfire while boiling tins of beans as you or I. Uh, I'll have you know that that's my weekends. No, it's not. Don't I just? It's not. Although I, I also when I go, I do like when I go camping. I go with my mates. I wish we played harmonica. That would be awesome. But I always just go and I've got some like tin of beans, <laughs> like some pasta in a bag that you mix with water. All of my mates arrive and they have like they've hiked with these giant bags into the woods and they're like frying up a stir fry. One of my mates, we went and he took like a he throws a giant steak put it in his backpack and we were hiking the whole day and it gets there and it's defrosted i'm like what are you cooking there and he's like got oh, a skillet and i'm like what do you mean and he's like brought a skillet and i'm like how much does that skillet weigh he's like probably like two kilograms and i'm like you put a skillet in your bag what are you doing and all my friends are like how can you eat this pasta and it's like you would don't you not like it and it's like of course i don't like it but it's just sustenance i'm camping i'm out here for the enjoyment of nature if i want to have a really good meal i'll make it at my home rather than make a half sort of good meal in the forest no just me apparently it's just me because i'll go with like four or five mates and they'll other than one dude who probably don't just drink beer <laughs> one of ours everyone will be doing some fancy meal and i'm just like no, i'm just gonna eat this pasta and then drink this bottle of wine that i brought <laughs> just just me apparently what are we talking about that was a tangent wasn't it and there have been multiple instances reaching down to the present day where rangers have fatally compromised investigations by stubbornly sticking to investigative techniques and assumptions which would have been thought of as quaint in the 1930s this isn't intended to dump on this proud and storied force the texas rangers are making sincere and significant efforts at reform but they're hamstrung by their own legends and the culture it sustains so the process is excruciatingly slow which may go some way to explain explaining why their investigation into Henry Lucas was so crude and perfunctory. Guys, I get it. I get that there's traditions and stuff, but when they're shit, just get rid of them. Like, yo, Texas Rangers, if they're not doing a good job, they should be replaced by regular police because, look, I'm not some fan of police work on this show. As we pointed, like, often it's not just, it's just not very good. And if the Texas ver- Rangers are like the shit version of the police, I'm extremely concerned. Chris seems to be more like, we should respect their traditions. I'm like, that if traditions are shit, get rid of them you know what was a tradition once like racism slavery that was a tradition it was a oh yes it's, it's a position of people in society it's like yeah but it's obviously wrong isn't it so we changed it it's tradition that women weren't allowed in the texas range and they obviously got rid of that because it's sexist get with the fucking times jesus i feel like <laughs> I'm not trying to be like woke or something. It's just some shit is like blindingly obviously bad. One of the crimes which Henry had confessed to was the rape and murder of Rita, especially when you're talking about really important stuff <laughs> like people committing rapes and murders. And the Texas Rangers be like, we got our guy, didn't we, boys? And it's like, no, you didn't. You, you could, someone confessed so they could get an insurance pay. It's like, well, I mean, maybe, but I don't really see the problem with that now. And it's like, well, you should. And it's like, how's that? And it's like, are you that dumb? Because there's a real murder out there. Oh, now we got our guy. Wait, do you not remember the beginning? Of, I'm, come on, come on, come on, do your job. Rape and murder of Rita Salazar and the murder of her date, Frank Kevin Key, in 1978 in McLennan County, Texas. It was a high-profile case sitting open on the books of newly minted McLennan District Attorney Val Furzel. Furzel initially looked on the confession as a gift, a career-making one, in fact. He said, quote, It would have been great to have my picture in the paper with a ranger standing there next to me with the real live version of Hannibal Lecter. DAs are elected officials in the United States, and closing high-profile cases is the, probably the best way to ensure their continuing tenure. Should district attorneys really be elected? That should that feels like it should be a career path thing, rather than a he got that murderer, so we're going to elect him again. But the murderer wasn't. That doesn't matter. We'll just cover that up with excellent PR. 
Fortunately for everything, Fazal was a conscientious type and he duly sent his investigators out to find corroborative evidence of Henry's claims, which they were unable to do. What they did find, though, was Bob and Joyce Lemons, who by now had teamed up with investigative reporters from the Dallas Times Herald, Hugh Ainsworth and Jim Henderson, convinced that Henry had never even clapped eyes on their murdered daughter, Deborah Sue. Fiesel decided to inspect the ranger's file on the case, but found that access had been blocked, by not only by the state database, but the federal one too, which was highly disturbing. <laughs> it's probably just covered in spilled beans and beer. It's like, oh no, it's, <laughs> the, the writing's been washed off it. Let's just say that he can't have it. <laughs> Yeehaw! In the meantime, Ainsworth and the Lemons were patiently tracking Henry and Otis's movements across the country and had already achieved some modest success. Faisal went to his boss, Texas Attorney General Jim Mattox, requesting approval to start a comprehensive investigation. A.G. Mattox, no fan of the Department of Public Safety, of which the Rangers were a part, told Fersal to go at it, which started the excellent investigative work which would culminate in a 60-page Lucas report. So you got the rangers out of the way, and some police work actually happens, which is... Why were you pussyfooting around it so much, Chris? Am I going to get cancelled for saying that the rangers don't seem very competent? Are people going to be like... Are all the Texas people going to be in the comments being like, Yeehaw! The rangers are the best thing to ever happen to our fine state! They were around when our state was founded! I know my accent's bad, I apologize, but... And I know most people in Texas aren't like this, but... There's a loud vocal minority, I'm sure, who are like, because Texas Rangers are like storied and shit. Well, whatever. I'm just doing, I don't know anything about this. I'm just doing it prima facie on the stuff in front of me. And the stuff in front of me says it's a bit shit, doesn't it? It should to you as well, to be honest. Maybe that'll change. Maybe they'll be brilliant by the end of the episode and we'll all have changed our minds. But the Rangers weren't going to let their prize go that easily. And here's where things get seriously hinky. Up until that point, it's actually not too difficult to see the task force as just haplessly stuck in an impossible position. They'd been publicly lauded as national heroes and credited with the capture and exposure of a massive threat to the public, but this necessarily meant they were also in full glare of intensive scrutiny by the media and the authorities. Any walking back from their current position of believing in Henry Lucas and Otis Toole would have been catastrophically embarrassing and it's easy to see how it might seem reasonable to just hold on tight and slowly and carefully get off the tiger that they'd been riding yes that's fine except when you're dealing with something this important but this is also something that goes on in police work all the time we've seen it many times on casual criminals police get railroaded on a suspect they'll be like well he's our guy and some evidence presents itself that says he's not the guy but the police will be like no no he's our guy he's our guy we got him down that railroad to someone innocent going to prison but this is absolutely not what they did. Hugh Ainsworth was subjected to intimidation and was also the subject of a home invasion where nothing but his professional papers were taken. And Furzel, who'd been wondering how the hell the Rangers had been able to lock down the federal database, got his answer when the FBI suddenly charged him with racketeering, corruption, and even homicide. What the f***? Slapping him with a collection of charges. This is a journalist who is being intimidated by the FBI. Allegedly. What? Slapping him with a collection of charges which could see him locked up for 80 years. As it turns out, the Rangers were pretty tight with the FBI. James V. Adams, then director of the Department of Public Safety, the parent organization which ran the Rangers, was previously the FBI's second in command and who'd been accused, among other things, of being part of an operation to attempt to blackmail Martin Luther King Jr. into either quitting public life or committing suicide. I've made a video about that as well. Crazy story. Also, talk about f***ing falling up, mate. You need to fall into a ditch. Adams insists that this was all his boss, J. Edgar Hoover's doing, just by the by. Okay, so allegedly he did this. Allegedly. It was also Hoover. Allegedly. Whatever. Anyway, Furzel's, even if you've got, even if that stink of that thing has rubbed off on you, you shouldn't be getting promoted to run the Department of Public Safety or whatever. Jesus. In my opinion. Anyway, Furzel's investigation kicked off a blood feud between Adams and Furzel, and Adams used every trick in the book to silence the young DA. Witnesses who'd been brought against Furzel turned out to have been leaned on by the IRS or Justice Department or both, and it also came out later that the Belo Bello Company, which owned TV station WFAA and the Dallas Times Herald's rival, the Dallas Morning News, was colluding with Adams to help smear Fiesel, which explains why a major Dallas broadcaster was willing to publish stories about Fiesel that were patently and obviously untrue. This is so crazy. 
all of these different federal things and newspapers are all just on this fake thing to railroad to uh to get this guy this da off the case this guy is like either gonna have his career destroyed or he's gonna become a legend and i get the feeling that because we're talking about this now he's gonna come out of this an absolute legend and a lot of people fingers crossed are gonna get fired or maybe prison time but i also get the feeling because of that martin luther thing and how he just ended up director of another department that they're just going to fall upwards into some other position which is really not on is it pressing on regardless even while he was effectively facing trial for his life as well as he's he's being tried for murder i mean what he's a he's, he's a sorry he's not a journalist he's the da is it what, what murder it's uh, the otis lee guy will be like yeah 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 uh, the, whatever those guys i know i messed up their names uh they'll be like yeah yeah no uh we didn't do that murder that was actually the da i know right how do i know that well i just do believe me and the texas rangers be like yeah yeah we believe you boy and uh apparently that's how justice works in america uh, smeared publicly by the Rangers and the FBI, who took every opportunity to perp walk him in front of WFAA news cameras, Furzel's investigators painstakingly pieced together the most exact chronology of Henry and Otis's movements possible, verifying and incorporating the earlier work done by Ainsworth, Henderson, and the Lennon's family. What Lemons family, sorry. What this revealed was that it was physically irresponsible for them to have committed many of the murders they claimed and highly improbable they could have done the rest. There were a handful of murders claimed by Otis and Henry respectively where they were, in fact, in prison at the time. For the period where they'd claimed they'd been committing murders in front of Becky and Frank, state school records show they were present in school hundreds or thousands of miles away. During one period in 1979, when the Rangers had the pair committing 46 murders in 16 states, Henry cashed 43 weekly paychecks at the same buy right supermarket in Jacksonville, Florida, and the store owner testified having seen Henry and Becky personally on numerous occasions. The store policy also forbade employees from cashing checks for people they didn't personally recognize, a policy which Furzer's investigators saw being rigorously applied when they visited the store, which means Henry, at least, must have been there. Further to this, the company they were working for had them clocked on basically full-time for the whole period, meaning Henry and Otis, even if they had been skiving off work, must have been running around the country like blue-arsed flies. Yeah, because they weren't. They weren't. This is so obvious. All of this is going to become clear, right? We're, it's. I mean, it, it, we know it becomes clear because we're making an episode about it and the DA wins, which is going to be sweet. And on top of all of this, once Henry lost his job in Jacksonville, he was subsisting on sales of scrap metal to a variety of metal recycling plants in the area, one of which had retained detailed sales receipts and testified to Henry and Becky showing up frequently in person to make their sales. They even recalled and correctly identified their vehicle, so frequently did they see the pep. Which does raise the question, what were they doing all those $10,000 hitman fees if Henry still needed to sell scrap to survive? Well, obviously, those hitman fees are made up. <laughs> I don't know how much a hitman is, but there's a lot of dumb people. Like, hitmen aren't what you see in the movies, right? It's not like some dude who's like ex-special forces with like a su super silenced gun sneaking into a place and putting two bullets in the back of some guy's head and then taking like a bucket of cash. It's like dumb people paypaling money to some guy they heard about on the internet for like $500 to pop someone off and the guy being dumb enough and getting caught. Surely that's what most hits are rather than what we see in the movies, right? <laughs> so 10 grand feels like a bit of a stretch for something literally anyone without a conscience can do. And as we found out on Casual Criminals, there are lots of people without consciences. In Furzel's office, they gave Henry the nickname Rocket Man, as they concluded that he must have been traveling by rocket ship to commit all those murders in all those places. You watch. Must I call me out, John? Jim Henderson of the Dallas Times Herald commented that he couldn't have committed all of the murders if he'd been strapped to the nose of a guided missile. The Rangers, who hadn't really bothered to check any of this, explained it all by accusing the foreman of billing fraud, a practice where employees don't go home, but the prime contractor is still billed for their work, which is then pocketed by the foreman. They. <laughs> Isn't that a bit of a problem? I mean, you're building work on a site, though. If you show. If I. I'm having construction done on, on my house right now, and I feel like if I got a bill, 
and I went and it was like work done and I went there and there'd been no work done I'd be like hey guys I got this bill and you've done nothing <laughs> and they'll be like uh I, I how does that work maybe I should make myself aware of that <laughs> <laughs> so I don't get scammed. They dismissed the school record, scrap metal sales, and everything else by saying that anyone could have been there cashing checks and selling copper and whatnot. But it wasn't just documentary records. Furzel, Ainsworth, and the Lemons had tracked down Henry's relatives and associates, none of whom ever wanted to see him again unless they had an opportunity to hurt him. And they gave a picture of his whereabouts day to day, which had him basically accounted for and alibied for all but a few weeks here and there. Basically, anyone who was actually interested in solving the case would have shut everything down then and there. And conducted a thorough audit and most importantly reopened the cases which their confessions had closed as for every one of these there was a potential murderer who had gotten away with the crime scot-free what the rangers did instead was ignore the lemons and anyone else who had doubts they'd bully and intimidate the dallas times herald reporters and attempt to frame vic furzel this is f***ed up Chris, why were you so lenient on them in the beginning? I don't understand. It's clearly awful. In 1985, the late, great Talus Times Herald published their investigative findings, opening two cans, one of worms and the other of whoop-ass from the Henry Lee Lucas Task Force. The Herald had unfortunately gone out of business, but I was able to find an archival copy of the On the Wayback Machine, and it's utterly devastating. Amazingly, however, it wasn't a death blow. So firmly had the myth of Mephistophelian murderers hiding their fiendish cunning behind facades of good old boy homeliness taken root, the story barely caused a ripple. But it did lend impetus to A.G. Maddox and D.A. Burzel's inquiry, and by 1986, the Lucas Report was released. This contained a summary of the detailed chronology of Henry Lee and, to a lesser extent, Otis Tool cross-referenced with the murders they'd confessed to. It's glaringly obvious from just a cursory glance down its neatly typed columns that the vast majority of these murders not only couldn't have been committed by these two, but that it was highly unlikely they were even connected. The MOs varied to a troubling extent, and the victim profiles were spread wildly across age, sex, and race. Variations in MO and victim profile aren't conclusive, of course, but even the most perfunctory of inquiries should have been prompted by these into asking some basic questions. And it seems this was all they did. It turns out the task force file basically contains nothing but records of interviews, working papers, and synopses, and a sparse log of confessions consisting of victim's name, date, and location, and whether the crime was attributed to Henry or Otis or both. Further digging poked even more holes in the case against Henry and Otis. Henry had taken to providing drawings of dump sites and victims' bodies and was able to provide freakish levels of detail, even down to eye color, which should have been a red flag in and of itself. It turns out various investigators have been feeding him information from the case files in a few different ways. Wow. Even with that, it was still obvious. <laughs> in some cases, interrogators would patiently ask the same questions over and over again until one of Henry's wild guesses would hit their mark, after which they'd feed him a nugget of information and then rinse and repeat. Where these confessions were taped and used in evidence, heavily edited versions, excluding Henry's confusion and inaccuracy, were provided to the court. At other times, members of the task force would secretly share key details of a crime with Henry ahead of an interview with another law enforcement officer. And on numerous occasions, he was allowed to refresh his memory during interviews by reading directly from the case file. Jesus, this is like, this go it just drifts beyond incompetence and cover-up to like, full conspiracy like this is nuts this has got to be a crime like this is the people allowing this to happen this has got to be like off the force and into prison sort of situation surely proof positive of this was the fact that on multiple occasions lucas had confessed to erroneous details which existed nowhere else but as mistakes in the files. For those police officers and investigators who came from external forces, the rangers insisted they follow a strict interview protocol to avoid tainting evidence, but don't appear to have backed this up with any supervision or oversight of any kind, which probably isn't surprising given what they themselves were up to. Otis, who was less famous and received slightly less rock star treatment, underwent a similar process, making wild guesses at MOs and at crime scenes until he hit on the right answer. All this, and more, was revealed in inquiries conducted by Maddox, Fiesel, and others. Vic Fiesel, by the way, was acquitted of all charges against him and was awarded the largest defamation payout in US history. $58 million! 
Oh my good lord. Not only did he make his career, but he got he doesn't have to have a career. Holy sh against the WFA News Channel, which helped the DPS director, Department of Public Ser Services or whatever it was, security, something like that, the, the, the people who oversee or manage the Texas Rangers, which helped the DPS director in his attempt to destroy him. He subsequently became Henry Lucas's attorney for a time and is now in private practice and will, perhaps understandably, spin wild tales of government corruption at every level to anyone who listened to him. Yeah, because he was proven right! It was a crazy conspiracy against him and the courts were like, yeah, the f*** was, here's 58 million dollars. And you were right, mate. I love it. I f love it and then he became henry lucas's attorney who probably doesn't have any money but guess what it doesn't matter so you got this brilliant attorney who's defending this dude because he's already he's, he's already made he's got 58 million dollars in the bank his writings and podcast interviews on the lucas case are excellent however i don't want to give the impression that he's crazy but he definitely does seem embittered and who can blame him for that nobody can blame him because he was a part of one of those conspiracies that we assume are the sort of thing that crazy people talk about except he was completely right F***ing legends mate <laughs> What followed was a bit of a catastrophe for the Texas DPS and the Texas Rangers. Good! In public and in circles which directly affected them, they had a whole battery farm's worth of egg on their faces. Strange to say, though, there weren't actually that many concrete consequences for this monumental balls up. There's a few reasons for this, and it's worth going through, the, through them. First of all, the task force was quick to point out that they weren't actually tasked with investigating the vast majority of the crimes that the pair had confessed to. And they're actually right. In most of these cases, responsibility technically and actually fell upon the individual jurisdictions investigating each crime. One reason why the task force files were so sparse. The task force insisted Botwell and Prince existed merely to facilitate their access to Henry Lee Lucas, and any hash made of the products of this access couldn't be fairly laid at their feet. Okay, that 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 seems to be like a fairly fair argument, except there was all of this stuff going on. You were there to facilitate it, but you were allowing all this crazy stuff to happen. Like the interviews and stuff being rigged. Like that's insane. This is partially true. If cops from Maryland, Virginia, California, and so on come to interview a suspect and then charge him with crimes he's confessed to, where exactly do the Texas Rangers come into it? From a strictly legal point of view, the argument's pretty unassailable. Sure, as reasonable people, we know that they have a duty of care and of diligence as a state law enforcement agency. That this obviously loopy idiot confessing to every crime put in front of him should have been scrutinized or even questioned properly just once or twice is fairly f***ing obvious. The task force practically advertised Henry Lee as a neat way to tie up old cases and improve statistics for any force willing to buy into the task force's fiction that Henry Lucas and Otis Tool were demonic tools of Satan pretending to be slow-witted drifters. But within the strict definition of the task force's duties and remit, someone hastily fleshed out in detail just after the roof fell in, they hadn't really done anything criminal which could be easily proved. Wait, they fleshed out the details of what they were supposed to do afterwards? <laughs> that makes no sense. It's hastily, hastily fleshed out after the roof fell in? It'd be like, oh yeah, no, it's all gone horribly wrong. Well, no, 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 we weren't supposed to fix it. We weren't fixing the roof. The roof just collapses, but you're the roof guys. It's like, no, 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 it's not us. We weren't supposed to fix it. We were just supposed to make sure that other people were fixing the roof. Which he didn't do. It's like, well, you know, it's a different argument there, isn't it? Insanity. What are you up to? And there was very little incentive to prove it anyway. Close on 100 police forces and investigative agencies were implicated in what was, at best, gobsmacking incompetence and, at worst, staggering corruption. The public's confidence in the whole system of American justice was at stake, an idea that wasn't as risable then it is as it is today, and there were powerful interests in favor of just sweeping the whole thing under the carpet and riding out the ridicule in the meantime. And then there was the somewhat incredible fact that the ridicule wasn't actually so bad after all. Unbelievably, even with all the evidence revealed by people who'd staked livelihoods and futures on getting it out there in front of the public, there existed a stubborn insistence on believing the confessions anyway. The myth crafted by the task force had resonated so powerfully with the American public that to this very day, there are numerous sources, some sadly quite authoritative, who will swear blind that Henry Lucas and Otis Toole were everything they claimed to be. 
If this seems incredible, just go halfway down the first page of Google and you'll see hits that still credit these two with being America's most prolific serial killers, delivering their obviously fabricated confessions as fact. These sites are worryingly numerous, and I fully expect to see some folks in the comments cursing my name and Simon's and stridently insisting that Henry Lucas and Otis Tall did everything that they claim to have done. Only Jane survived to be raised by the wisest of the mystics. Yeah, well, uh, after listening to this and looking into it and, you know, don't necessarily trust my research. If you doubt me, go look into it yourself and see what you come up with. Go beyond the first page of Google where it's just some random website telling you of their guilt. Do some research and then come back to me. And I will kill you. Because look at it. Look at the facts. It's crazy. This isn't... it. It couldn't be more obvious. It's important here to make a quick comment on conspiracy. Most reporters, including the makers of the recent de Netflix docuseries The Confession Killer, agree that there wasn't really a concerted conspiracy to encourage Henry and Otis to make confessions up. They weren't coerced, particularly, and the first confession was unsolicited. The strong impression here is that right up to a certain point in time, everyone involved here initially thought that they were doing the right thing. The chummy relationship with the suspects can be explained through interrogation technique. The provision of police file details was clearly rash rationalized as helping along a suspect who couldn't possibly have remembered all of the details of his hundreds of crimes. And there were people within and external to the task force who did question or dismiss confessions as a result of good police work. In the end, only 11 murder convictions were returned as well as a death sentence for Henry Lee Lucas, and it seems pretty clear that the murders that Otis were convicted of were actually murders committed by him. Where it all went south is when the task force lost control of the scope of the enterprise and then tried to cover it up under scrutiny. What I'm trying to say here is that yes, wrongdoing definitely happens, but it really doesn't look like anyone planned to do it from the beginning. Yeah, but there were so many exits. There were so sometimes you got to see yourself down a path right and be like, F how did I get here? But I need to get out. There's got to be a point where you're like, this has gone too far, and it's like, I know there are going to be consequences, but oh my god, look at where we are. You know? You see this on TV shows all the time, and it's like, oh my god, how did this character... It's like the character's journey, right? I think of, um, like, Breaking Bad and stuff, and it's just you go down this journey, it's like, how did you get here? But you can't get out. It's so crazy. And I mean, in that show, he didn't really want to. God, that show's good. <laughs> I recently was uh, watching the the new series of um, uh, Better Call Saul, and it just reminded me how good those shows are. Of course, many people, including Vic Furzel, disagree. And all I can say to that is that I'm not sure enough of the majority opinion that this was a snowballing cock-up rather than a dark plan from the outset to dismiss what they say. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I'm always like on the conspiracy side. It's like, yo, let's say that this, like, I'd lean towards this being a cock-up rather than a conspiracy and a dark one, a dark conspiracy, but also... It does seem mega suspicious. I'm not, I'm, I'm nowhere near decided, for sure. Especially as it's clear that in the course of trying to silence their critics, a full-blown Hollywood-worthy conspiracy sprang into action. Yeah, with the dude who got the, the settlement. Suborning the DOJ and the IRS in an attempt to jail a public official and silence any skeptical voices. They accused him of murder! A, an attorney general! A non-attorney general, a district attorney! Man's madness. The dignity of history. Back in the ancient world, the question of what did and didn't constitute history was largely an uncharted issue. Mainly because the rules of history as we practice them today were still being formed. The problem was that the immense totality of past and present couldn't be recorded. It's not even really possible today. But there was disagreement on how best to select those things which must be presented or emphasized in order to create a historical account. One of the concepts Livy and others came up with was the dignity of history. The basic idea was that since history was a highbrow sort of affair, mostly concerned with great matters of state, kings and generals and whatnot, there was a bunch of stuff to do with everyday common living that just didn't matter enough to sully history with. Which is why we know Julius Caesar's exact itinerary on the morning of his death, but not how the microcredit network underpinning the entire Roman market system worked, or even if it existed. Yeah, all of this stuff would be so cool to know. Like all of these little minutiae of Roman society, and instead we only learn about them through the history of the greats. Which, I mean, is still cool. But there's so much we don't know. 
Uh, and sorry, there's other ways, of course, we know about these more small things in history, like there are clay tablets preserved with accounting ledgers and all of this stuff, but it just wasn't in, uh, purposefully recorded. I know this seems like a million miles away from a pair of purported serial killers in 80s America, but it is a problem that's relevant to any poor sod trying to research their lives and deeds. The fact is that Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Tool existed in a world which is rendered darker by the fact that it's still considered beneath the dignity of history. Or to put that another way, the whole enterprise of history is ill-suited to capturing the lives of the very poor, mostly owing to the faint echoes of ancient snobbery, which still dog historiography to some extent to this day. Is that true, though? I'm kind of more... It's not about... Um, sorry, like, snobbery. It's about making a mark. Like, if you took a look at two people, sure, we could look back at Julius Caesar and we could look at a random Roman peasant. But we're not going to be very entertained or very interested in the life of the Roman peasant today. Just like our newspapers are filled with stories about politics and celebrity and business and all of this stuff. Because... This is more interesting than oh yeah, Mrs. Jones went to the went to the Lidl, and she bought a loaf of bread. Fascinating, but that's something everyone does every day, or you know, the equivalent of. I don't think it's snobbery. It's just we record the most interesting parts of history. So even with the scrutiny under which their lives came after they'd started swapping confessions for steak dinners and cigarettes, it's still difficult to find good quality sources for their lives and doings. Which means that once again. I have to make a note on my sources. A worrying proportion of the accounts of their early lives rests solely on the personal testimony of two proven liars, namely Henry and Otis. Having said that, given the remarkable consistency of these accounts as contrasted with their depictions of their latter lives, I've accepted these, albeit with a largish pinch of salt. I've also made heavy use of the Lucas Report, a painstaking chronology compiled by A. G. Mattox and D. A. Furzel. This is mostly owing to the scope and rules of that inquiry, where they deliberately set out to establish a ranking of evidence types, or as any good investigator or intelligence analyst should, prioritizing documentary records, then independent first-hand accounts, and then all the other secondary and tertiary sources. I've also made use of the full judicial opinion in Henry Lee Lucas Appellant and the State of Texas Appellee, which contains a wealth of primary evidence as well as updates on and summaries of the various inquiries conducted up to 1989, including Mottox and Furzels. I've also prioritized various court documents relating to lawsuits filed by and against the various law enforcement agencies involved, as well as the meager collection of publicly available police documents which aren't tainted by, well, this whole bloody thing. Beyond this, there's a fair amount of investigative journalism, starting with the Dallas Times Herald Sterling First Expose, and a variety of other sources including Time, Vox, AP, and so on. Various interviews conducted by reporters and filmmakers over the years with Sheriff Botwell, Ranger Prins, Vic Verzel, Bob and Joyce Lemons, documentarians Tarky Oldham and Robert Kenner, reporter Jim Henderson, and of course Henry and Otis themselves. And these were available for piecing together details which were confused, disputed, or both. I'm more reading this and I'm like, this is an amazing, like, it's it's nice to know where all the sources come from, but holy sh am i blown away by chris's effort on this piece because my god is it long and my god is it detailed and he's looked at all of this stuff even like oh yeah i looked at a documentary Docu there was a documentary series he mentioned and i'm like well you watched this <laughs> oh my god i feel like i am the lazier and i know i am i'm like the laziest part of the whole the whole process here chris writes this epic script and then i'm just like da, 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 da. <laughs> i just block some shit massive credit to chris on this good lord and i've basically dismissed nearly everything else almost all of the secondary sources get a host of elementary things wrong or a, a little more than exercises in gore porn ah yes <laughs> true crime as a genre a few of the big true crime channels get it right, but they're often very light on detail for reasons that I completely understand. At any rate, what follows is the best account of their lives that I was able to put together. I should know that Henry and Otis led chaotic, peripatetic existences. And also, Chris's vocabulary is so strong. Like, I know the word peripatetic, but I've never used it in a sentence. What was that one I had to look up earlier? Methusialism? Oh man, do I feel dumb today. And I've not included every single pointless trip across the country or brief sexual partner. This is very much the highlight reel, sticking with the events which either shed light on the case or on the character and nature of the two men. The Actual Chronology 
Henry Lee Lucas was born in 1936 in Blacksburg, Virginia, in a four-room shack where his mother Viola made a tenuous living as a prostitute. Henry was the youngest of either six, eight, or nine siblings, most of whom had been farmed out to relatives or foster care by the time he was born. His father was an alcoholic who had lost both legs after passing out drunk on the tracks where a train ran over them. Holy good lord. Wow, don't don't get too drunk, guys. If you're drunk enough that you don't notice when your legs have been run over, but you don't notice you've fallen asleep on a railroad track. He's a zombie. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and I'm sometimes like, I drink too much. It's like two glasses of wine. <laughs> when did I become old and get headaches the next day from like two glasses of wine? Why, body, why? He supplemented the household income by making and selling moonshine. Many accounts claim Henry was a profligate drunk. Again, this word. I feel like it's like profligate, wasteful or dissolute. Big brain. And this habit started with his father giving him moonshine as a child of brilliance. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Uh, Viola appears to have taken a dislike to her son and would regularly beat him. Brilliant parenting there, good job. Should also make him watch her having sex with clients. You're f***ed up, lady. And from the age of seven, began dressing him as a girl in the hopes of pimping him out to both men and women. Oh my lord. This is one of the few early details we can corroborate as the school board took out a court order to force Viola to stop. When he was eight, he got into a fight with one of his brothers who cut his eye with a knife. Viola's neglect led to the wounds becoming infected and the eye was replaced with a prosthetic. That same year, Viola called him over to watch her having sex and when he didn't respond, she became so incensed that she hit him in the back of the head with a plank, knocking him unconscious. Records are sketchy, but Henry seems to have been comatose for a period of days, first in the chicken coop that was his bedroom and then later in hospital um yeah that probably didn't do him any good for his later you know murderous confessing craziness in 1949 when henry was 13 his father either ran away from the house or simply got drunk and fell asleep in a snowdrift causing a fatal case of pneumonia henry couldn't cope with being the sole target of viola's wrath and he ran away the following year hitchhiking his way to lynchburg in 1951 where he claims he raped and killed a 17 year old girl laura burnsley who matches his description did go missing in lynchburg but her body was never found so it's not clear if she was ever even murdered lucas later recanted this confession and while it makes a neat victim zero story it may have never actually happened around this time he went to reformatory school where his iq was tested returning a result in the 70s which is very low and if you're in the 70s and you've killed hundreds of people i'm just gonna say you're probably gonna get caught because you're not you're just not bright enough to get away with it 70s is very low that's on the edge of mentally disabled he seems to have fallen in with a local gang and taken to breaking and entering in 1954 age 17 he was convicted of two counts of burglary and sentenced to six years of virginia state prison he has alternately described this period as one of the happiest in his life saying he had a bed and regular hot meals for the first time and as a living hell where he was repeatedly raped it seems that lucas was bisexual and had a series of consensual relationships with inmates his sexuality appears to have been a source of inner conflict as he offered wildly contradictory accounts of his sexual encounters with men either denying they ever happened saying he enjoyed them or claiming they were non-consensual it's worth noting his denials ramped up after his prison conversion to christianity in 57 <laughs> of course it did in 1957 lucas and a few others escaped from a road gang but he was quickly recaptured and served another two years before being released on parole upon release he went to tecumseh michigan to live with his older sister carol and he got engaged to a girl that had been corresponding with viola got wind of this and came to michigan for a visit oh my god i'd be like please don't visit me you crazy old bag by now in her 70s she wasn't earning like she used to <laughs> yeah yeah she wasn't so he decided to force henry to return to blacksburg to take care of her henry wasn't exactly in love with this idea and he refused they went to a bar to hash it out got drunk and when they got back to carol's place viola began beating him with a broomstick according to henry he lashed out in self-defense and hit her in the neck not realizing he was holding a knife wow that's gonna be really tricky especially as you're on parole mate henry stole the car oh god you're going back to prison and fled towards Blacksburg before, thinking better of his plan, tried to hitchhike his way back to Michigan. On the way, he was picked up by the highway patrol and charged with his mother's murder. Oh yeah, oh my god, this episode's so long, I totally forget that he actually murdered his mum. Ah, The court rejected his plea of self-defense, and he was sentenced to 20 to 40 years. He served 10, being released in 1970. That seems quite light. 
for an American murder case, or a murder case anywhere, to be honest. Almost immediately, he was arrested for attempting to abduct two teenage girls and locked up again, being finally released on the 22nd of August 1975. From here, he headed by plane and automobile to Maryland, where his half-sister Almeida Kaiser, Kisser maybe, lived. He met up with her on the 23rd or 24th, which is important, as he's supposed to have killed Deborah Sue Agnew Williamson 1,600 miles away on the 24th of August. On the 5th of December 1975, Henry married Betty Crawford, the widow of one of his nephews in Elkton, Maryland. Multiple members of the family attended the wedding, which isn't surprising, as he was marrying a family member. <laughs> that makes it sound incestuous, but it was she was a family member by marriage, right? <laughs> Yes, okay. <laughs> they spent the night in Chatham, where another of his nieces had a place. This is the day he supposedly murdered 19-year-old Linda Byakler, stabbing her 19 times with a kitchen knife in Lancaster, 72 miles away from Elkton, and over 40 miles from Chatham or Oxford. Oh my god, <laughs> this guy is basic. All of these, like, uh, except I don't know Elkton, but Oxford, Chatham, Lancaster, these are all places in the UK. Uh, which isn't exactly surprising. I know there's lots of places named after, but it's interesting to see so many in one sentence that's an American script. I guess it's possible that Henry got married, drove his family interstate, and then took a two-hour round trip to kill a woman without anyone noticing, but it does seem a little bit doubtful. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> During his time as a married man, Henry lived in trailer parks and hitchhiked around looking for work and selling scrap metal. He did work a few jobs, most of which didn't last more than a week, and eventually his family gave up giving him new ones. He did travel, but nowhere near as much as he claimed. When questioned, Henry's extended family said he was rarely gone for more than a day, apart from a couple of random week-long work trips that he took either to find work or to pursue some harebrained scheme or another. This is important, as the pattern of life described by his cohabitants doesn't match in any way to the one described in his confessions. This relatively settled period didn't have long to run, however, as Henry began sexually abusing his prepubescent stepdaughters oh, Jesus. just before he got married to Betty. His half-sister Almeida spotted blood on their underwear and confronted him about it. Lucas, according to Almeida, asked if she wanted to leave him. She said she didn't have to unless he was abusing her granddaughters. What the f*** is going on? That's some f -ed up f right there. The next day, he stole her husband Wade's truck and hit the road never to return. Probably for the best for all the people you left. I'll be like, oh, thank f God. Thank you. He's left. Yes. Party. Really subdued, depressed party. Otis Toole was born in Jackson, Florida in 1947. Do you think it's Jacksonville? I know there's a Jacksonville in Florida. I guess there's also a Jackson in Florida. How creative. His parents were abusive alcoholics, and it seems that from a very young age, Otis was forced into sexual activities with relatives and family friends. Yeah, no, that's normal, you know. Yeah, that's a brilliant way to, to, to not scrap your children there, isn't it? I wonder why he ended up the way he did. He also claims he was sexually assaulted by his elder sister before the age of 10, realized he was gay around the time he was 12, and became a male prostitute by the age of 14. Brilliant stuff here really on the route to a successful productive life otis said that his grandmother was a satanist who would involve him in satanic rituals which is well highly dubious he also tells a story of being dressed as a girl by his mother and pimped out to said family friends it wasn't uncommon in the mid-20th century in some parts of the u.s for parents to dress young boys as girls and Hemingway is probably the most famous example that is weird why would they do that I don't, I don't get it. In the US, gendered kids' clothing became the norm around 1920, but there were pockets of the country that were way behind the times. Well, there we go. I didn't even realize that. Like, we didn't care about how children dressed like as boys or girls until the 1920s. That's kind of fascinating. I didn't know that. And as an internet fat boy, I'd kind of thought that I would know that. Someone will probably point out that I've made a video about this and I've just forgotten. <laughs> Small brain. With Lucas and possibly Tool, there seems to have been a sexual motive, but this is one of the many instances in which one man's story may be bleeding into the others. In the case of Lucas, there's photographic evidence of his being got up in a dress and ringlets, but not so with Tool. It's possible, though, that these two bonded over very similar life stories, and that all of it's true. It certainly was verified by Verzel's investigations that both Tool and Lucas were subjected to horrific neglect and abuse, and it seems beyond question 
Otis was sexually abused throughout his youth. At any rate, Otis led a peripatetic life, drifting through the southwest of America, panhandling and selling his body. He claims to have killed a traveling salesman who propositioned him for sex by running him over with his car at the age of 14. Holy sh**, they get started young, these killers. Allegedly, probably not. Who knows? Otis was suspected of several murders of men and women throughout the 70s, and he was a known pyromaniac, experiencing sexual arousal from lighting fires. Is that what pyromania is? I thought pyromania was just people who like setting fires. Do you have to experience sexual... Because I always like... I don't know. I quite like making fires. Like, don't get any ideas. I'm not going to burn down any buildings. But when I go camping, it's like, let's make a big fire! <laughs> Yeehaw! Oh, pyromaniac arsonist. Okay, I've been describing myself wrong. I just thought a pyromaniac was someone who loves fires. I'm definitely not an arsonist. Don't get any ideas. Especially when he thought he might be burning people. Oh my god, no, I don't have that. I just like to burn wood like a normal person. <laughs> yes, I'm having a little glass of wine. I'm at the office very late today. And, um, well, it's late, so I'm having a glass of wine. <laughs> Okay. I had coffee earlier. Um, it's later in the day. I think this is the first time I've ever made a video while drinking. I've definitely had drinks sarcastically before. Like, I've had, like, a bottle of whiskey that was filled with, like, tea as a joke. Um, but this first time. Fascinating. <laughs> From this point on, all my videos grow markedly downhill as I become a daytime drinker and a solid alcoholic. Otis probably rates a video of his own, despite his usual billing as second fiddle to Henry. It's possible Otis had much more agency in the relationship than he's given credit for, and in terms of what can be verified, it seems he was the more violent one. During Fersel's investigation, almost all of Henry Lee's associates were shocked to discover he'd murdered in cold blood, whereas most people who know Otis weren't surprised at all. If you have a mate, <laughs> And you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm not surprised at all he murdered that guy in cold blood. If you feel yourself that you could say that about your mate, <laughs> she, do you really want to be friends with that dude who'd murder someone in cold blood? Jeez. <laughs> Didn't surprise me at all. No. Yeah, Bob was always down for a bit of cold-blooded murder. In 1976, Otis was back in Jacksonville, Florida. I knew it was Jacksonville. Mm. Living with his wife, mother, sister, and his niece and nephew, Frida and Frank Powell. Frida and Frank were his half-sisters, Drew Sillers. She had separated from her husband, and since neither could look after her kids, she'd left them in grandma's care. Otis would regularly visit a local shelter, sometimes up to three times a week, to cruise for sex. His sister said he'd often go out in drag, better for luring the men. He'd also enjoy watching them have sex with his wife. She'd reported that he, quote, couldn't perform with a woman unless he knew he could get a man. She didn't stay with him very long, but this didn't bother Otis as he was just as happy watching men have sex with his sister and, on occasion, his prepubescent niece. Oh my god. There are conflicting accounts of when Henry and Otis actually met, as both men shifted the meeting significantly earlier, presumably to de-conflict with their false confessions. Investigators say that they couldn't have met until 1977. According to Sarah Pierce, Otto's sister, Henry first started appearing in spring 1977. She said most of the men Otis brought would stay a day or two, mooch beer, food, cigarettes, and then leave. Henry was different, however, as he stayed. Henry denies having sex with Otis, but multiple people who lived in the house reported that after about a week, Henry moved into Otis's bedroom more or less permanently. Lucas had also developed a close bond with Otis's niece, Frida, whom he liked to call Becky for reasons unknown, as I pointed out earlier. Weird. According to Lucas, he and Becky first had sex when she was 12, after tickling each other in bed. What? I don't... This, this, this episode... There's all sorts of f***ed up in this episode. It just somehow keeps getting worse. For much of 1979, both men worked Naval Air Station in Florida as laborers for Southeast Color Coat, one of many companies owned by the Reeves brothers, whom Otis had known for years. Every week, Otis, Henry, and Becky would go to the Byright supermarket to cash their paychecks and also frequently to buy groceries. Sometime around 1980, Lucas stopped working for Color Coat and began selling scrap metal. Commercial Metals, the ones who kept their records, reported seeing both Henry and Becky more than weekly, with either him or Becky personally signing the sales receipts. In May of 1981, Otis's mother died and they were forced to leave her house. Documented records show that they were away for about three weeks. They then went to Houston, then to Del Rio, where they sold their car before riding the rails, stowing away on freight trains to Tucson, Arizona. This feels like the old school. Uh, like drifter movie trope 
whether there's that they they run along the train they catch up with the train they throw their bag in and then they climb in it's, it's, it's like sounds romantic and horrible at the same time at this point they claimed the children became sickly and irritable so they rode the rails back to houston before hitchhiking back to jacksonville it's not clear the children were even with them they drifted through delaware and maryland for a while before shacking up together in an apartment in jacksonville henry returned to maryland for some reason and was jailed for a few months for the theft of wade kisser's truck he was released on probation and then had that probation transferred to florida in 1981 becky had been living with her mother in auburndale florida was sent to an emergency shelter when her mother committed suicide becky escaped in 1982 henry picked her up somehow bought and insured a vehicle and left with her sometime after january the 10th having discovered that she was wanted by police for escaping state custody wasn't she just in a shelter it's like yeah you gotta go somewhere because your mother killed herself and you cannot leave <laughs> this is where otis and henry finally separated with otis remaining in jacksonville and fuming about henry running off with his niece otis and his wife went to california to look for work got into a car accident which hospitalized otis and then separated with otis's wife returning to jacksonville while he stayed on apparently working for a fencing company for all of this period they were supposedly killing dozens of people in multiple states honestly it sounds like they were quite busy doesn't it and they were showing up places where they were recognized and documented so uh yeah it doesn't really seem very believable does it henry and becky also headed to california where they pitched up on the property of an 82 year old kate rich they worked for mrs rich for a while as cater as carers and odd job folks but kate's family were suspicious of henry rightly so <laughs> and soon convinced her to dismiss them becky and henry headed south and came to the all people's house of prayer a pentecostal commune in stoneberg texas run by reuben moore reuben was in the roofing business and as the founding member of the commune he was in the business of saving waifs and strays when becky and henry arrived they claimed they were married reuben gave henry a roofing job and he and becky stayed in the commune henry says he was happiest here he had work and becky and he got along with reuben and most of the others unfortunately becky didn't like their new situation and they began arguing as she wanted to return to florida and lucas couldn't he had violated probation in florida and had also transported becky a minor across state lines oh yeah all this time she's a child <laughs> god uh, while well, she was wanted by the police which would have been bad enough if he hadn't also been having sex with her which also amounted to trafficking a minor across straight lines with the intent of committing indecency which carried a potential life sentence ah oh, dude you are committing some serious crimes here my guy to play kate he offered to hitchhike back to jacksonville and borrowed money from reuben for the purpose they left the shelter in august 1982 when according to henry he and becky began to argue and he hit her with a knife just like mother dearest he's like i don't know i got there it's just suddenly in my hand maybe you should just be not allowed knives mate he had sex with the body oh my god he killed her he had sex with her body claiming it was the best sex he'd ever had with her before dismembering and disposing of it oh my god he returned with a story that becky had run off with a truck driver the locals especially sheriff conway were suspicious good and he was questioned and held multiple times the local school superintendent had kicked him off a work site on the grounds that a murder suspect shouldn't be that close to children no shit. or perhaps he thought anyone like henry shouldn't be anywhere near children for any reason also true <laughs> henry declared on multiple occasions that he would find becky bring her back and clear his name once he even convinced kate rich to join him in looking for her kate had liked becky and was one of the loudest voices in suspecting henry of foul play he took kate for a drive stabbed her in the heart violated and dumped the corpse and then returned a little while later to burn it in his wood stove oh my god why if you are the person who thinks he's murdered his underage girlfriend's wife victim sorry victim um why the f would you get in a car and go looking with him especially when you suspect him of being super weird and of murdering someone you're insane kate with the finger of suspicion now pointing at him for both kate and becky he claimed that some criminal acquaintances had kidnapped them and that he would drive out to where they were being held and recover them he bought an old pontiac and told reuben he was leaving to get them over this period lucas had wandered around the country several times hitchhiking to maryland where he was briefly jailed for parole violations and somehow acquired a 22 caliber pistol 
It wasn't unusual for him to take a week-long trip and call Reuben to borrow money to get back. It seems Lucas was punctual in paying most of his debts. He drove the Pontiac to New Mexico and called Reuben Collect to tell him that he had Kate Rich and Becky Powell with him. He called again from San John to say that the car had broken down and asked for a lift. Reuben, who by this time was as suspicious of Henry as anyone else, consulted with Sheriff Conway and then drove out to get them. Sheriff Conway was not a good man to consult. Sheriff Conway should have been like, Reuben, what the f*** are you doing? Stay the f*** home. I'm going to go out there with a gun and some other dudes, and we're going to sort this out, because Reuben, you would get murdered. But oh no, off Reuben goes on his adventure, and let's see how that goes. When he got there, he found Lucas in tears, claiming his criminal friend, a man named Jack Smart, had re-kidnapped the two women. Reuben suggested he call Sheriff Conway as a bluff to get Lucas to confess to whatever he'd done, but to Reuben's surprise, Lucas made the call. It was while he was being interviewed that Reuben agreed to swear a statement about Henry Lee's possession of the 22 pistol, which allowed the sheriff to lock up the suspect and question him. And as we heard at the top of the piece, they held him four to five days before Henry started his confessions. Oh my god, Reuben survived. That's so nice. I was like, he's definitely going to get stabbed in the heart and violated. Oh, I'm pleased you survived, Reuben. <laughs> Wrap up. Both Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole died in prison. Henry of heart failure in 2001 and Otis of liver failure in 1996. Henry was convicted of 11 murders, and for all we know, he may have committed some of them. Texas Ranger Glenn Elliott says he sometimes caught Henry trying to confess to murders he didn't commit, but was convinced on at least one occasion that Henry was the actual killer. Otis Toole was convicted of six murders, two of which he almost certainly did commit, but in the case of Adam Walsh, he died when he was in the process of being indicted, and somehow police lost crucial evidence, so that case remains unsolved. As pointed out earlier, however, most people, including the boy's father, believed he did it. Otis's six death sentences were commuted to life on appeal. The best estimates of Henry's real body counts are anywhere between three and twelve murders with a question mark over Otis. And this is probably the best we're ever going to get. As the years went on, the Rangers, the task force, and a bunch of different local and state police forces were pilloried in the press, but this curiously didn't last as long as the inexplicable belief in the pair's false confessions. Yeah, because it's not as interesting, and there's a news cycle, and everything's like, go, go, go! And this is just not as clickable. It's like, yeah, biggest murderer ever. Clickable. Biggest murderer ever. It turns, it turns out not to be biggest murderer ever. It's not that clickable. It's just not. Sadly. That's, you know, corrections at the bottom of page 11 sort of thing, isn't it? Both Henry and Otis were subject to even more media attention after the stunning incompetence of the police in general, and the task force in particular was revealed. And of course, the key question was why on earth they confessed to all those crimes. Henry's given multiple answers over the years, including saying that he did some or all of them, but what he said most consistently is that he was out to, quote, destroy Texas law enforcement. Otis <laughs> kind of did. Kind of did. Pretty embarrassing situation here, boys. Otis has given a dizzying number of reasons, one of which was that he was confessing in the hopes of getting transferred to the same prison of Henry as Henry so he could kill him. What a lovely thing to say. <laughs> well, they're not going to do that if you like. Why do you want to get transferred? Murder. I want to go murder my mate. But we're not mates anymore. What is clear is that a big part of why Henry confessed was to improve his life in prison, to get special food and privileges, and, it seems to me, to please the people around him. Both of these men had IQs in the low to mid-70s, though in Otis's case he was probably underrated as his tests didn't account for dyslexia and other difficulties, and he does come across as more intelligent, though the less sane of the two. The whole case was summed up best, in my opinion by Jim Schutz, a veteran reporter and scourge of City Hall, when he opines that the Rangers had attempted to paint Henry Lucas as a monster and a killing machine hiding behind the appearance of, quote, a gap-toothed idiot. And it was only when ordinary citizens, some journalists, and a high-minded DA decided to probe the case that the truth came out, that it was actually a gap-toothed idiot posing as a monster. Schultz essentially captures what happens here. Looking carefully through Henry's movements and decisions, it's easy to see that he really was a feckless drifter, dealt an unbelievably raw hand by fate, and too stupid and brutal to improve it in any way. And when he started confessing, it really does seem that on some level, at least at first, it was just to get some smokes and maybe a walk outside. As we can see from this excerpt, from the very first letter he wrote to Sheriff Conway to quote it, Whatever inside me, I hope will leave me alone. Since I am not allowed to buy cigarettes or make phone calls to get any, we will see what will come out of this mess. I have cigarettes at home, but I can't get to call to get them, and no one can talk to me because I'm not allowed to contact anyone. 
I'm here in by myself and still can't talk with a lawyer on this. I have no rights, so what I can do is convince you about all this. I can't take you to where they are because no one believes me, and whatever I say seem like I'm talking to myself. Yeah, well, that's the end of today's episode. I mean, other than dismember dependencies, which we'll get to in a moment. And it's just... <laughs> what a bizarre episode. Dismember dependencies. Number one. George W. Bush, when he was governor of Texas, came under a lot of fire because of the way he handled death penalty cases. As governor, he was the highest state authority when it came to clemency or stays of execution, and had infamously said in public that he considered all these cases very carefully, sometimes devoting as much to 15 minutes as praying to as much as 15 minutes to praying and thinking about them. <laughs> When Henry Lucas's case came before him, he was looking at a presidential run, but never once overturned a death. This, added to the manifest weakness of the case against Henry, led him to commute his death sentence to life in prison. The first and only time he'd done this. Wow, George Bush, savage governor. I mean, although to be fair, I do find pardoning a little bit weird. I don't think... Actually, I kind of agree with him on this one. Let the courts decide. It's not your job to suddenly be like, nah, all of that's bullshit. Commuted. And like... The president gets to pardon people, I guess like governors do for like state crimes. I'm just guessing that's how it works, I don't know. But the president's end of his term is like, adieu, 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 you can all go free, adieu, 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 adieu. And it's like, this is mental. The courts have worked really long on getting those people in prison for probably good reasons. And also then they're like, yeah, and you're my mate, and you're my mate, and you're my mate, and there's a lot of political pressure for me to release you, and maybe you'll give me a job. You go free, you go free, you go free. What are you doing, America? Number two, over the course of my career, I've spent a significant amount of time surveilling heavy drug users, and the whole time I was beating my head against various walls, trying to untangle the lives and behavior of Otis Tool and Henry Lucas. And the thing that kept bugging me was just how much their activities resembled that of severe drug addicts, but none of the sources mentioned anything about drugs. Plenty about booze, but no drugs. And this for a pair of drifters moping around the USA in the 1970s. Finally. I found a single reference to their drugs problem in the judge's opinion on Henry's 1989 appeal. I guess all the murder and whatnot pushed the narcotics off the map. Yeah, but it's important context, isn't it? Number three, there's been quite a bit of speculation about the sanity of Henry Lee Lucas, with various experts both diagnosing him as a schizophrenic, while others deny this and claim he has a sociopathic disorder. It seems this is still hotly debated to this day, and since he's long dead, it's unlikely that we'll ever know for sure. <laughs> People carrying on with that debate, doesn't matter anymore, he's dead. Number four, the Salazar key murders, the ones which set Vic Furzel off on his costly quest, were subsequently solved by DNA evidence. Needless to say, the killer was not Henry Lee Lucas, but one Benny Tierina, who was stopped for drink driving in 2007 and submitted a DNA sample. Whoopsie doodle. <laughs> you don't want to be doing that. You need to fight that if you've been murdering. He's currently doing 40 years for both Rita and Kevin's murders. Excellent. Number 5. Henry Lucas owned a total of two firearms in his life, one 32 rimfire obtained mysteriously on a random road trip with a stranger, and one 22 caliber pistol that he acquired later. Henry could never afford ammunition for either of them, and despite the fact that many of the murders he confessed to involved shooting deaths, neither a weapon was ever linked to any of the crimes, probably because he couldn't afford the ammunition. Ammunition surprisingly expensive. I realized... I don't know why I was looking it up, but I was like, how much is how much is a bullet for a gun? <laughs> I don't own a gun. I wasn't looking to buy a bullet. I was just curious. Or I, there was a reason I was looking at this. And it was like, the equivalent of like 50, 60 cents or whatever. I'm like, Jesus Christ, for each shot? You go to the firing range, you bang, 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 bang. That's an expensive hobby. Maybe it was slightly cheaper than that, but it still felt quite expensive. And nor was he ever thought to have owned any other firearms. Fascinating. Number six, Samuel Little, who confessed to 93 murders between 2018 and his death in 2020, is often mentioned in conjunction with Henry Lee Lucas. Like Lucas, Little claims his mother was a prostitute and that he traveled the country killing women. Like Lucas, he provided drawings of the women he'd murdered. He also made his first confession to a Texas ranger. Unlike Lucas, 60 of the 93 murders have been confirmed. Oh my lord. Uh, the timescale of 93 murders over 35 years is plausible, and there's actual evidence other than his confession linking him to many of the killings. Oh my god, Samuel Little, you are definitely going to be on this show in the future, you psycho. That's for sure. Number seven. While Henry was on death row, a woman came forward claiming to be Becky Powell, which chimed in with his later denials that had ever killed her. It turned out to be Phyllis Wilcox, a notorious superfan of serial killers who'd visited Henry to cook up a plan to help him in his case. You f 
fucking psycho. Why are you up to that? Number eight. Some of the crimes Henry confessed to have since been solved mostly through DNA. There are myriad others which are still officially closed, however, and victims' families have been petitioning to reopen these investigations. I can't believe they're not open. Or at least, you know, like cold cases or whatever. They've made little progress, as it's a hell of a lot of cases. It makes all the agencies involved look like fools again, and thanks to being closed decades ago, they're very old. Having said all of that, though, it's clearly the right thing to do. Yes. So, if you come across an affected family petitioning online or protesting in person, perhaps consider lending your support, as they surely deserve the justice promised and denied to them by the Henry Lee Lucas Task Force and every cop who used it as a handy way to balance their murder books. Yes. And that is where we end this very, very lengthy episode today. Thank you, Chris. Um, at the beginning, I promoted something that Chris is doing, which was so long ago, I've forgotten. It's not. It's a writing thing for a cancer charity. There is a link to it below. Check it out. Thank you, Chris. Um, also, if you enjoyed the show, give it a like, give it a subscribe. If you're listening as a podcast, a review would be amazing. Thank you. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>